Hey everyone, and good morning or good afternoon from where you are calling in around the world. Um, I'm Robbie, co-founder of Immutable, here to chat about a couple of things. First, state of the market update, and second, a deep dive into Passport, in particular context for the updates from Ledger we've seen over the last week. Uh, there'll also be a live Q&A, so please chuck in your questions, um, Tim will send them through, and I will try and get to as many as possible. With so I wanted to start with a state of the market, which is what are we seeing at the moment uh, in gaming in particular, uh, and also to cover the recent ledger controversy over the last couple of weeks? So first, I wanted to cover what we're seeing in Asia. And there's a really interesting bifurcation that the United States is split between a pro-crypto attitude uh, from some sectors of the country and a heavy red crackdown from the SEC uh, and, and uh, current party in power. At the same time, we're seeing Asia completely buck this trend. Interesting stats we've seen are A, China is now tacitly an approver of crypto, um, which is a really significant step. And the reason we know this is because Hong Kong is completely opening up to Web3. They've seen a lot of capital flight to Singapore over the past few years, uh, and they very much want to be the open and economic home of Web3 innovation. They've literally created a $50 million Web3 marketing fund from the Hong Kong government. Uh, we have huge amounts of investment activities by family offices over there. Uh, obviously, you have major gaming companies like Animoco who are based there, uh, who are becoming extremely active uh, in terms of engaging with the local community as well. Um, so this is super exciting, partially because of what this means for uh, you know, China's implicit approval of a lot of this activity. What we're seeing is in Korea and Japan. Four months ago, the Japanese Prime Minister said uh, NFTs and Web3 was one of the areas of priority for that country over the next year. Since then, we've seen investments from MUFG, from Mitsubishi Group, from some of the largest institutional and sovereign investments in the place into Web3 and also in particular into Web3 gaming. Properly engage with the region, you typically need a, a local listing, you need team on the ground. Uh, we've just hired our first boots on the ground on Japan and likewise in Korea, and we're going to become incredibly active in the region. Uh, from a gaming perspective, this is extremely exciting. The biggest markets outside of the US are China, Japan, Korea. Japan is the highest spend per capita gaming country in the world, uh, where people are on game designs that are fundamentally aligned with Web3 gaming. And we also know that the sentiment toward Web3 gaming in Asia is much more, they're ready to go hard now with some of the biggest companies in the world, whereas in the US it's going to require delivering games where Web3 is invisible under the surface uh, in order to make Both approaches are going to be extremely exciting, but I think the interesting thing is as we grapple with the media on the US side, Asia is full steam ahead um, and it's one of the biggest markets in the area. From the investment side, the other scene is there has been the most resilient investment category in, in crypto has been gaming, particularly early stage deals. We're seeing a number still come through. Uh, we're seeing a number of large investment players uh, in the space. And there's also more than $300 billion of VC capital sitting on the sidelines invested. And we're seeing a pickup over the last quarter in particular over the pace of these investments. You have Savvy Games, uh, which is a, an arm of is PIF sovereign fund allocated 40 billion US dollars purely to invest in gaming. Uh, so we're seeing a huge amount of uh, gaming activity. The way I best like to think about this is if I asked people, name the top 100 technology investors globally, there would be a large list of sophisticated investors, sophisticated methodologies. If I said the same thing for gaming, you might be able to name five, maybe 10. And if I said Web3 and gaming, you might be able to name one or two. But gaming as a category is bigger 
than all software as a service companies combined uh, as a vertical category. So we're going to see a huge the skill caliber and attention paid to gaming investments. And I think Web3 is at the forefront of this. Um, so I, I think some really interesting macro shifts in the past uh, couple of quarters, uh, obviously interest rates still dominating most of the market's movements today, but we're seeing for the first Ethereum and Bitcoin bucked the trend of global macro, um, which is an extremely bullish signal. This was the original hypothesis that they would be hedges. Uh, only really, I would say, months have we actually seen this play out in the market. Uh, obviously, there was a massive controversy with Ledger announced service where your private keys could be withdrawn and shared to multiple servers uh, securely in order to be able to provide you with the ability to, to recover that Ledger if you need it. And I think this is a great example in not just uh, misassumptions people have around technicals of wallets, but also how important messaging and customer experience is for these things. Because the initial reaction has turned out to be most ledgers and most hardware wallets are vulnerable to this form of software update, which could some form of private key. And there's been some responses from Ledger as well. I'm not going to go into our, you know, our particular opinion on this. I think the more important thing is that custom incredibly easy and convenient solutions. But B, we also need to be extremely explicit about the privacy uh, and security trade-offs. of. Uh, we always want to offer our users a choice. If they have hundreds of thousands of in-game items, if they've got extremely valuable land, they should be able to secure solutions. But we also think it's incredibly important to offer a highly secure solution, which is completely self-custodial, which we legally and uh, from a security perspective cannot touch, which is incredibly easy to onboard with. Uh, and being upfront about both expectations, but the user experience from day one is essential. I think on the context of Ledger, Passport as a product is even more important the 100 million, the billion users that are going to onboard into Web3 in the next three, five years. And so deep dive on that, the security architecture, the usability today, uh, and why we're so excited as to how this is going to significantly improve the conversion for Web3 games. Quick one, let's recap the immutable flywheel, the core strategy driving all of our actions today. Um, our goals are, how do we onboard more uh, Ethereum? How do we then make these games more successful? And I think this is a major differentiation. The reason that two years ago, one tenth or one twentieth of the money other major blockchains had, we've been able to gain market leadership in Web3 Gaming is we are built by game developers for gamers. Every bit of our product is focused on this. We don't care or bother around PFP or DeFi or collectibles. We've been obsessed with solving this use case for Web3 Gaming from day one. And I think that was enabled us to gain this market share with funding. Now, obviously, between us and the foundation, we have more than a quarter billion dollars in the bank, and we can really focus on how do we operationalize our game to be genuinely successful. Our main approach here is with immutable publishing on the intellectual property side, where we're constantly experimenting with how do we create the next sustainable economy design, which can be a guaranteed win for gamers. And in every major shift in gaming, uh, when you see most when you see free to play, when you see social games, they really only took off when you had a game be massively successful and made that playbook available for everyone. Your Farmville or Mafia Wars, which were reskinned and copied 30 times and made it very accessible for people to build successful social games. The first gacha games in mobile being successful, which led to an entire new genre and paradigm quickly flooding the space after. With this, so that any game on our platform can know precisely without being an economy expert, without a crypto developer, how can they make a successful economy that empowers and rewards players and delivers 10 times the value of the existing industry? Um, and, and, and that's why we're so focused on that part of our essentially flywheel. Community members, um, the reason you know, I spend so much time uh, talking to you, being completely open about our strategy, is ultimately our vision is put ownership of stuff in players' hands rather than in the hands of a single company. We're doing this with assets. We're doing this with giving every single trader on the platform INX every single time they trade. Uh, it is uh, you guys that will be the ones evangelizing, the ones giving us the critical feedback and helping universal protocol to trade value and empower players everywhere to truly own digital items. Uh, this is a very serious commitment from us. It is one of our four main pillars for uh, the company strategy. And finally, more exposure. How do 
community, how do we leverage these games in order to continuously build our brand and this branding of digital ownership being real for everyone. So let's jump into problems with wallets today. First problem, every wallet, uh, particularly a custodial easy onboarding, requires one wallet per game per user. The problem with this is one wallet fragments liquidity for every single game you build on. Let's say a developer is building a new trading card game. It means deposit new funds, pay fiat on-ramp fees, which are substantial today based on the maturity of the fiat on-ramp market, to deposit Ethereum or crypto or USDC if they want to use that to pay for transactions. Uh, and also these trades can't connect with other wallets on the ecosystem. Our vision, uh, as I'll go into, is a single wallet you can use anywhere, console, mobile, PC, desktop, and be able to use this across any single game uh, you use. So you can constantly use the same currency and we can build this giant network of players with easy liquidity ready to be spent. This is the exact same strategy that the App Store did and why it has such a strong distribution it's incredibly easy to pay for things on the App Store. And one of the misconceptions they'll call out is actually, you know, people often call out the difficulty in on-ramp and they point to the App Store as an example. But the one thing I'll call out is when you first use the App Store and you have to set up your user account, your KYC, your email, your credit cards, it's actually a reasonably difficult and burdensome process. And we think we need to create this on ramp, but then make sure you, once you're on ramped you have access to the entire ecosystem. And the problem is people have to keep onboarding over and over again, not just that that onboarding isn't as good. Obviously, we are uh, expecting a lot of people today to have 24 word seed phrases, particularly if they use the wallet today, uh, like MetaMask. Um, and we just simply don't think Web3 Gaming will go mainstream while requiring people to write down on a piece of paper and store in a safe for 98% of people. We want to support that as much as possible. But the essential thing here is self-custody. And I think that this recent ledger, the trade-offs in self-custody are not as clear as people think. Uh, and that actually, for instance, hosted HSMs secure as full ledger self-custody for the majority of users and the majority of trade-offs. And ultimately under the hood, be self-custody rather than a hosted wallet or rather than a database or centralized solution. We think that's essential. It opens up composability and it means that we're fundamentally delivering on our promise of players owning digital stuff. So let's quickly cover Immutable Passport. If you haven't used it by now, I highly recommend you go to the Immutable Dev Hub where we have an example. It will take you 10 seconds to onboard. We're incredibly proud of what the team has built. It is very early beta. We still have to take this multi-platform. Uh, we still have to build out a, a lot of interactions with say, cross roll up liquidity, fiat on-ramps. The beauty of this is by owning this Passport layer, we can seamlessly integrate it vertically. So you can be building on a custom immutable ZK EVM, which we built with Polygon for, say, Blizzard Activision, if they put Call of Duty on just a hypothetical example. And all of your user trades there can be seamlessly cross-liquid and instantly match with the immutable platform. And I think this is the key innovation we're trying to focus on, is our vision is you should be able to trade any digital asset on any roll-up, uh, on any marketplace, on any game. And you shouldn't have to know how under the hood it's working. And all of those trades should be able to match. If we can get that right, we're creating the most valuable financial primitive ever created. A global seamless order book to trade value uh, and to match value. And, and that will be better prices for, for gamers everywhere and far more volume, making this in-game item spend into a, a trillion dollar market. In terms of marketplaces, Obviously, the Immutable Passport is a global order book. When you sell something on Immutable, it doesn't just list on one marketplace, it lists everywhere. And my favorite stat so far, only my favorite stat is, over half of trades on Immutable today are listed in one marketplace or venue and bought somewhere else. Um, I played Gods Unchained yesterday, I my cards was GU decks, because I instantly wanted to buy a deck that would help me be less crappy at that game. And this shows if someone wants to sell their card in game or on GameStop marketplace, they can do that, but I can still buy those direct assets and all the marketplaces can take fees using the global order book. 
We have frictionless purchases. I'll go into this in detail. Uh, with credit card, with USDC, with ETH, with whatever you want to buy or whatever the game developer wants to empower if it's their particular currency as well. It's completely secure. Um, so not only do we use uh, full self-custody through an MPC, immutable is a co-signatory in all of your transactions. That means we can never move your assets, but we have to sign off if a game is trying to do a transaction. So we can be a second layer of 2FA and verification on all of this activity. And that's what enables us to use the same wallet for you across every single game you use. Obviously, mobile is the default. Uh, mobile is going to be the future of Web3 gaming, particularly over the next few years. Um, and the immutable garden is what I was talking about that today. And finally, we're going to be integrating this with Unity and Unreal to make it incredibly quick for game developers. Uh, this is extremely exciting. So if you haven't used it already, signing up quite literally looks like clicking create or log in, you get given an email, you type in your password, and you're signed in. We think that this type of on-ramp uh, is incredibly If you go to most games or most websites, you'll get asked to sign in with social auth or with OTP. It converts the best in the space, and gaming is all about conversion. Uh, the game of, for instance, mobile uh, marketing is all about how cheaply can you get users to click through, and how frequently can you get users to click through. Uh, and then how do they stick on in the game beyond that? Right now with crypto, we are preventing any scale because you cannot performantly run what we call performance up marketing, which is essentially you know, running ads at scale, measuring what is applied to those ads uh, and making sure your means it's a profitable funnel to run with billions of dollars. Gabe Layden, the founder of DigiDaiku, was the grandfather of this for mobile gaming. He spent billions of dollars on Super Bowl ads uh, for Game of War. You probably remember them with you know, uh, Kate Upton and, and Armageddon. And his number one thing is we cannot currently do that because requiring someone to write down their seed words or on board at the moment is killing them. It means it's 100 times more expensive to advertise than peers in gaming in general. Uh, so we're tracking the improvement in conversion with every game implementing passport, we'll be sharing stats and we expect this to improve by anywhere between 10 to 25x uh, with the passport product. Uh, and finally, this is super exciting, we're going to be enabling frictionless in-game transactions uh, with natal, native single click confirmation for things in game or in mobile web incredibly easily. We've gone to Unity and Unreal support. Over half of game developers worldwide use Unity. Uh, the majority of the rest of them use Unreal to build their games. It's that any solution which wants to be adapted by developers integrates natively into these solutions. We're obviously already integrated into Unity. We have multiple games live on the Epic Store. We're really excited to continue partnering here and make sure this is as usable as possible. Uh, and finally, obviously compatibility with Z uh, is what we're working on as our nearest next priority. Um, so feel free to check out this. Uh, this is how we're this to the space. We think it solves all problems. Obviously, we'll support any wallet on the on the platform, um, but we're really excited for this to be a default. Uh, and current stats are, I think, over ninety percent of games on the platform are excited and essentially looking to at some point integrate or have this be the default wallet they use for their games. So I think the reception so far has been insanely positive. As we need to build that data and say, well, hey, this is how much better your performance marketing is going to be with this product. We're really excited. Uh, and finally, checkout and passport. So our vision, and obviously we have many, many partners here, and we, we build internally, but we want, if you want to withdraw your assets to a bank account, uh, if you want to be able to withdraw it or swap them to another wallet, we want to support the best possible use cases. Uh, so we have what we're calling our checkout products, which integrates natively with we work with a number of fiat off-ramp and on-ramp vendors uh, when we work to essentially allow you to be able to a incredibly easily deposit with a credit card into your balance or off-ramp into a bank account i will show a quick demo in twitter you've probably seen this i also don't know if you can hear this
Awesome. Um, I'm going to jump into Q&A. So uh, I think we had a few questions. I picked from the most important ones. As always, we try and handle every question we get thrown uh, and be transparent. First, can we know which games will integrate with Passport when it's launched? Absolutely. Uh, you'll obviously know as you'll see the Passport branding. Basically, the vast majority of games building on Immutable uh, and Immutable Polygon with CK EVM, we, we think we'll be using Passport. Uh, we'll keep you up to date as these games actually launch and as they use their wallet products. Two, uh, how will partners like Polygon and games like Shardbound work with Passport? Uh, Shardbound will work like any other. Um, they'll obviously be using Passport from uh, day one. Uh, and we will be rolling out ZK EVM support with Polygon basically uh, as soon as possible. Um, third, why are we introducing products like Passport and Checkout at this stage of the roadmap? This is a really good question. Uh, the thing I often refer to is if you look at why a large company like Google or Amazon does or does not do a product, it is based on a strategy question. Is it best for them to offer that product or not? For example, lots of the fiat gateways or uh, on-ramps like Visa do not want a direct customer relationship because that brings on legal liability, even though that is a product they could technically build. Uh, for startups, the question is very different, which is uh, we have limited time, uh, limited resources. How much can we get done as urgently as possible to help do the next most important thing? So really most of our roadmap has been guided by what are the most important products we need to solve for game developers now. That's why we started with a non-smart contract compatible chain. The most important thing was a working product that was secure with ZK, we wouldn't accept anything else. And uh, a validity implementation with StarkX was the first one we could take to market. Now we're at the point where games are actually maturing. 40 to 50% of all the funded games in the space will release over the next 12 to 18 months. There will be major breakout hits with tens of millions of players. It's a pretty foregone conclusion. If you have 15 billion US dollars of investments and a Call of Duty type hit takes $200 million to build. We're gonna see successes, we'll see a lot of failures. And our vision now is, well, how do we improve the success rate as much as possible by developing products that make it incredibly good for consumers? Um, and we really want to be a market leader here. We're spending a lot of time in the cold face of the App Store, of uh, Android, of uh, Samsung negotiations to make sure that we know exactly what will be permitted, uh, what, what is the, the riskier approaches, and we can advise games on, well, hey, this converts the best. This is how you get the best price for your users. This is what we think is compliant. And unless you're actually building an uh, Breaching the rules, you really don't know the policy of these companies. Uh, they're incredibly opaque. Finally, what is the roadmap for Passport and the INX marketplace? Are there any plans to offer an exchange within it for the tokens that don't have liquidity outside of IMX? Will we see more trading and discovery features added soon? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think the beauty of building a smart contract chain rather than just an app specific crawl up with immutable ZKVM is we now get all of the DeFi that exists everywhere else to build on this. Um, so without going into too much detail, I would be imagining, uh, if I were you, all of the things you commonly see servicing DeFi or swap services on other chains, we're going to see replicated pretty quickly on this ecosystem. Uh, we'll have a public roadmap launching next month for some of the features that we're building, but also this is completely open source, permissionless, we're going to see a ton of innovation, uh, so we're really excited. In particular, because I think DeFi has, in some respects, put the cart before the horse. It's often been, well, let's build incredible DeFi products and financial services without actually much stuff to trade outside of, say, Ethereum or Bitcoin as payments. If you look at financial services in the real world, derivatives and uh, options protocols and index funds all exist once you have sufficient liquidity of the primary stuff being traded. Like, for example, we have futures markets on pork knuckle. Just because there's billions of dollars that are traded every year, no one actually wants to trade futures in this apart from their sufficient primary liquidity. So these financial services service asset trade. We have the same hypothesis for DeFi in this space, which is the greatest source of secondary liquidity for stuff, for assets, is going to be gaming. There's $150 billion of items every year. What will emerge from that is well, hey, here are all the financial services as DeFi infrastructure that can now service this stuff. In five or 10 years, you'll see Goldman Sachs trading desks trading long option uh, protocols on, for instance, Fortnite skins uh, and saying, you know, they, they want to hedge this particular category of game genre assets. And we think that's really exciting, but what that requires is excellent games first. 
And from there, everything else can be built out. So that's why we're focusing so much on this as the most important factor to get right. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions, team, that we should be looking at. I'll check out the YouTube. Otherwise, chuck them in the Discord for our next one. Um, hopefully these are helpful. Please give us feedback. We aim to be as transparent as possible. Uh, honestly, last six, eight months have been incredible with the Polygon partnership. Um, it's been exceeding our expectations so far. So uh, continue to expect big things and we will continue to deliver on our roadmap. Thanks everyone and see you next time.